Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, the house. So the text we look at this morning is the conclusion of what many believe to be the greatest sermon ever preached. I believe this happened early in Jesus' ministry. He calls the disciples and goes up onto a mountain with the disciples. And at the base of the mountain are multitudes. So Jesus has pulled away from the multitudes and taken just those 12 who had committed their lives to follow him. And he takes them up on this mountain, and there on the mountain, he begins to impart these kingdom principles to them. He starts teaching them things that are just radical literally turned the religion of its day on its head. He touched on so many different aspects of our normal everyday life. He talked about money. He talked about clothing. He talked about lust. I mean, there was really not many issues that we face in everyday life that Jesus didn't touch on in this Sermon on the Mount. And after he goes through this radical outline of kingdom principles and communicates them to his disciples, he then concludes his sermon with an illustration. And this illustration that he's using, which we'll be focusing on for the remainder of our time this morning, this illustration is really, I believe, haunting almost. It is a very serious illustration that Jesus (coughs) has given to his followers, and also to us through the written word. So I want you to see verse 24, 27. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. This illustration might have a little more meaning for some of us now than it it did a few weeks ago, right? Haven't some of you had some serious rain falling and some serious winds blowing and some serious floods come rising? Some of you may have actually had PTSD just as a result of me reading this to you. So I know that it has been very serious with the weather lately, but I want us to think about and use that, this realistic weather situation, as helping us be able to understand this maybe a little better even. I want to look at all these components of this story, and then at the very end, I want to be able to put them all back together and look, having viewed each one of these different components of this illustration, as clearly as we possibly can, put them back together and say, Jesus, what are you wanting us to be able to learn from this illustration? Notice the first picture that really makes up the central theme of this last illustration, and that's the house. The house. When Jesus was choosing a word to illustrate his point, and to really, really punctuate what he was trying to say. He could have used any word, honestly. I mean, he had no uh, shortage of opportunities or illustrations he could have drawn from, being literally the omniscient God that he is. But he chose a house. (coughs) Jesus wasn't teaching us first century engineering and architectural uh, lessons here. Jesus was doing something that I think is really profound. He was driving to the very heart of our life. You see, what Jesus was teaching 2,000 years ago really has application for us today. Because the thing that a house represented 2,000 years ago still represents that for us today. When you think of what does a house mean to me, for many of us, a house means our home. For many of us, houses are some of the places we've had our best memories. Some of you have had to sell a house before, and you probably remember going back through that bare house, everything off of the walls, and and all the furniture was removed. And You probably remember going back down through the halls and and reminiscing about different things that happened in different rooms. And and it, and it it reminded you just how significant that house was as it related to your family. You know, if you think about it, a house is built to protect 
the things that we consider to be valuable or precious. That's what a house does. It protects our family. It protects our possessions from the elements. It provides some bit of security. And Jesus here, when he's summing up all of this Sermon on the Mount where he has dealt with all these different life issues, he comes back to his followers and he throws this out and he says, I want to show you, as I'm closing this out, he says, I want you to understand something. And he chooses a house because for us, house represents life. For us, what is inside our house is precious. It's valuable. For many of us, it's priceless. We have our homes to protect those valuable things from the outside world. I want you to see the second part of this story. And that's the storms. If you notice, both both houses saw storms. The house of the wise man who heard the teachings of Jesus and did them, and the house of the foolish man who heard the teachings of Jesus but didn't do them. Both houses saw similar storms. The rains descended, the winds blew, and the floods rose. You ever been in that situation where you felt like it was coming at you from every angle? Anyone? Yes, that's the situation Jesus is picturing here. This storm where the rain is just pounding on the roof and the wind is just blowing against the walls and now the flood starts to come up. Everywhere this family looked in this house, they were being attacked. You know, Jesus doesn't highlight what this storm was. I believe he leaves that up to us. And you know, if you think about it, there are emotional storms that we've faced in life. You've probably been in a relationship that went south and maybe there was a lack of trust and you were heartbroken. Maybe you've raised your children to live a certain way and you're heartbroken now because that relationship, they're just not living the way they were raised. Maybe it's an uh, um, an emotional storm. Maybe someone has absolutely broken your heart. Maybe someone has devastated you emotionally. And that storm just came blowing in and you didn't even see it coming. Maybe it was a financial storm. Maybe you walked into your office one day and they handed you a box and told you you needed to get your stuff. You were going to be laid off. Maybe one of those storms came blowing up in that way where maybe you were going to do some home repair and you did this one little section and you realized you needed to replace a whole half of your house. Financial issue that you didn't see coming. Maybe it was a physical storm. Maybe you just went for your annual checkup and now you're waiting on the call from the doctor to find out what, that, what the results really are. Maybe you did hear the news that you didn't, nobody ever wants to hear. You have six months to live. That would be considered a a physical storm. Something you never saw coming, weren't expecting, and didn't necessarily anticipate, and yet it is blown up, and it is coming down on you from the top. It is pushing in on you from the sides, and now it's starting to flood you from the bottom. Maybe you're in the middle of a spiritual storm. Maybe right now you're wrestling with God over areas that you know you should be walking in obedience to, but you're not. Maybe you came in here this morning feeling like a spiritual failure because last night you yielded to that temptation you said you would never do again. I don't know all of the storms that could be in your life right now. All I know is that living in a fallen world, we face many different kinds of storms. And both houses went through those storms. If you think about it, I know for me, I try to avoid storms as much as possible. You know that. You've been around people before that wanted to avoid the physical storm, right? They knew that there was a lump on their neck, but they didn't want to get it checked out because they didn't want the doctor to tell them what they thought they were going to hear, right? We've all known those people. Or they know that they can't breathe when they walk up four sets of stairs, but they don't want to go to the doctor because they really don't want to be faced with that storm. Or the couple that doesn't really want to have the hard conversation about something they know is a real issue in the relationship, but they don't want to talk about it because they don't want to bring a storm in the relationship. Or the husband or the wife that wants to talk to the other one about the financial decisions that are being taken place in the, in the relationship, but they don't want to bring it up because they're worried that there's a storm. What I have found oftentimes in my life is that I avoid storms because I'm worried I won't endure it. And if you think about it, maybe for some of us, you don't have that conversation with your spouse. 
You don't go to the doctor, not because you don't want to hear it, but you're worried deep down you're not going to be able to endure it. You're worried that your foundation is not strong enough for you to be able to stand on. And I think for us, avoidance is a natural, a natural defense mechanism. We want to try to avoid conflict. We want to avoid challenges as much as possible. But when it comes to challenges and storms in life, Christ has not called his people to avoid them. He has called his people to endure them. And when we're looking at this story, this illustration in which Jesus punctuates the teachings that he's given and drives it home, He says both the house of the wise and the house of the foolish both saw the exact same storm. The ability for the house to endure the storm had nothing to do with its strength, style, or structure. It had everything to do with its foundation. Everything. So I want you to see number three this morning. The foundation. There are only two foundations. Jesus gives us number three, foundations. Only two. One represents the wise builder, one represents the foolish builder. The first one that Jesus gives us is the rock. You know, when I was a kid, and I heard this, read this teaching, heard this teaching, I had in my mind this picture of this rock protruding out of the ground and a house being built on it. Am I alone there? Anybody else have that kind of a picture? Okay, that's foolishness, right? We know that's not the case. Where Jesus was at that moment, the people understood exactly what he was meaning. You see, because under that sand and under a very, 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 very thin layer of what we wouldn't even consider, but they would, topsoil, You had to dig down a little bit to get to the bedrock. You had to dig down to get to the sturdy stuff. When Jesus is telling them that, they would have understood, I have to skim off all of this layer of sand on top. I have to put in a little bit more work to dig through the stuff that is not a good foundation to be able to get to the stuff that is a good foundation. And when he's talking about these two different types of foundations, I believe we understand why the rock is a better foundation than the sand. First is this, it's solid. It's one piece. Jesus' teachings, God's teachings, either Old Testament or New Testament, are all one. You remember what Jesus, when he was asked, we studied this not long ago, when somebody asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Do you remember what he said? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, who is the epitome of the new covenant of the New Testament, literally went back into the Old Testament and said, this is what it is, and even for us now, this is the great commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. What Jesus was reminding us is that his word is literally a one-piece, solid rock. We are able to build our lives entirely on the word of God, no matter which covenant. Second is that it's stable. It's not going to move. When Jesus is talking about this, and when we dig away from all of that sand and put in the extra effort to get away that which is not a good foundation, and then build on that solid, one-piece, stable rock that's not going to move. What I love about this is that even though the winds blow, they're not going to blow the rock. Even though the rain is going to come, it's not going to affect the rock. Even though the floods come, the floodwaters go around the rock. They don't carry the rock off. The rock is solid, stable, and strong. It's not going to break. It's not going to come apart. It's essential that the rock doesn't fall apart because whatever's built on that rock will fall apart. If God's word, if God's teachings were going to fall apart, do you know what that would do to our life? Do you know what that would do to our faith? It would tear it right down the middle. But God's word, God, Jesus is saying that we can build on the rock, which is his words, not just the hearing of them, but the actual putting them into practice because the rock is solid, stable, and strong. Now compare the sand. Millions of little granules, 
millions of little pieces, not connected, together. Sand shifts, moves, slides around. It's not solid. It's not always been there. It's come in lately. You know, if you think about it, there's never a situation in my life or yours where the Word of God does not have application for it. There's never a situation today, right now, 2019, there will never be a situation that I will face that the Word of God will not have some perfect application for the situation I'm going through. The Bible tells us one generation shall declare your works to another. We have the promise that God's word is always applicable in every season of every situation of every life throughout all generations. Secondly, the sand settles, moves with disturbance. You see, if you think about it, the life that's built off of philosophy, the life that bases its decision off of the culture around it, we have to remember that that culture, those philosophies, did not exist probably a hundred years ago. They've changed. You see, our philosophies often take on the, the likeness of the culture in which we live. Culture drives philosophy. So if I'm building my life off of philosophies and theories of man that change as the culture does, that means my foundation is not going to be constant throughout. What happens when culture changes? What happens when philosophies change? What happens when man-based wisdom then begins to take on a different form? I have to change my foundation. That happens when you build on the sand. Taking pieces here and there, little granules of wisdom. I use that with quote marks in the air. Philosophies or thoughts or just even your own decisions. And maybe a little of the word of God here and there. But they're granules. They're not one big, solid, stable, strong rock. The sand shifts. It settles and it separates. The fact that it separates is probably the greatest of all the dangers. Because they are not bound together. Because those little pieces that we've gotten, that we've built our life off of. Because they're all individual pieces and can move as the water or the wind dictate. The problem is that house that's built on that sand, when the sand begins to move and slide and shift and settle, so does the house or the life that was built on it. One affects the elements around it. That's the rock. The other one is affected by the elements around it. And that is the sand. What's the result? Number four. Jesus says in verse 25, And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. What was the outcome of the wise builder who heard the word and did it? He had a house. Remember, this isn't about architecture or engineering. This is about spiritual development. Jesus said the one that hears and does is the one whose life will endure the storms. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Verse 27, the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. A person who hears but doesn't do, doesn't put these teachings, teachings into practice, finds himself in a very dangerous place. I want you to think about what Jesus is doing because I believe it's very intentional on his part. In order to put a capstone on this teaching called the Sermon on the Mount, in order to drive home his point, what does he do first? He chooses a word that everybody understood. That everybody, under, that everybody associated with the essential elements of life, which is our house. 
So he grabs something that is near and dear to everybody that's listening, and then he highlights its endurance or its destruction. So he takes this house and this image that we make of family and protection and priceless and precious things and protection and something that we build and he takes that and he literally says, here's one that endures and here's one that crumbles. If you don't think Jesus was trying to drive home the point, look at the order in which he releases them. The first one is the positive one. The wise man who hears and does is the one whose house endures. How does he leave the story? How does he end the Sermon on the Mount? He ends it by saying, the one who hears these sayings of mine but does not do them loses everything. Everything that is precious, everything that is valuable, everything that is worth protecting gets washed down the river. Jesus ends his teaching looking at the worst case scenario. He ends with the negative. I want you to see how the Sermon on the Mount starts. Look back at chapter 5 with me for just a moment. Chapter 5, look at how the Sermon on the Mount begins. Chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Listen, verse 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed. Verse 4, blessed. Verse 5. Blessed. Verse 6, blessed. 7, blessed. 8, blessed. 9, blessed. 10, blessed. 11, blessed. He opens the Sermon on the Mount by saying, blessed. Markarios, happy is the man. How does he end the Sermon on the Mount? The rains fell, the winds blew. The floods rose and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. He starts out by by pronouncing blessings and warns at the end about what happens if we don't do, don't believe, don't employ these truths in our life. Such a paradox at the beginning. Happy, Markarios, happy. And great was the fall of it. Psalm 1, the very first psalm in your Bibles, is believed to be the key to understanding all of the rest of the wisdom literature in God's Word. It really is the key to the door of the psalms. Psalm 1 begins with the word blessed and ends with the word perish. And here Jesus starts saying blessed and ends with that sobering reminder. The image of the house. What is so important sliding down the stream. What do we do? In light of a sobering teaching from Jesus, what do we do? I think it's important for us in light of all that we can lose. A life that we've worked hard to build. A reputation that we've worked hard to build. A family we've worked hard to build. In light of all that we can lose, I think we should be able to evaluate and look sincerely into our heart and ask some serious questions. Here's the first question I want you to ask. It's a diagnostic question, really, to diagnose if, which one of these is you. And the first is this, where do I turn when I make decisions? When I'm making decisions in my life or for my family, where do I turn? What is my matrix for making decisions? Do I make my decisions based off of just what I think is right? The Bible warns us that a way that seems right to a man ends up in the way of death. We're not wise enough 
to make our own decisions apart from the Word of God, to make those perfect decisions. We can mess up. My family is worth me making right decisions for. Where do I go? What's my matrix? Is it the Word of God? When I get a decision, do I turn around and say, okay, how does this line up with the Word of God? You may say, Pastor, I don't know all the Word of God. This is awesome. You don't have to know all the Word of God. Go back to chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. Moms, dads, go back and read. Pour over. Spend the next weeks and months just pouring over that teaching of Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and compare your life to those teachings. Am I living those out? Am I walking in obedience to those words that Jesus gave? Secondly, I think we need to ask ourselves this. Are there biblical truths I know that I'm not doing? Jesus said the foolish man is one who hears. We could, we could tell you, we could do really good in Bible trivia. I mean, if there was a Bible jeopardy, we would kill it. But am I doing it? Is it a part of my life? Are we walking in disobedience to the word of God? Willful disobedience to the word of God. I read a story about a seminary president that was wanting to learn how to fly a plane. And he asked his flight instructor, he said, why do we have to sit in front of a flight simulator so long? And the flight instructor very quickly responded. And he said, in a time of crisis, you never rise to the challenge, you fall back on your training. And if you think about it in our lives... We fall back on our training. The more familiar and acquainted we are with the word of God, the more we're going to fall back on that which we know. Now, guys, here's the deal. We kind of like it that Jesus is talking about houses, okay? We like that he's talking about building. But I'm going to tell you something. Bryce Schwarting, I am not, okay? I consider light changing a light bulb home improvement, all right? That's, that's not me. I would, oh man, there, I can think of a hundred things I would rather do than home improvement. My wife was in here. She would raise and testify. She would. If we're those people this morning that say in our heart, God, this is me. God, I'm the one who's built on the sand. I've heard it, but I'm not doing it. I wish Jesus would have said that the word of God is like a roof. That's what I wish he would have said. Because if it was a roof, I could go back and change the roof or have Hiram replace the roof while leaving the wall still up. But Jesus intentionally told us, it's not the roof, it's the foundation. In order to fix the foundation, you've got to tear everything down. Spiritually speaking, I don't know about you, but I want a quick fix, don't you? I want the easy way. I want to be able to push a button. It's not that way. Jesus tells us here, If you're in a situation where your house is built on the sand, listen, please hear this. If your house is built on the sand, you tear it down or it falls down. That's the only options. I come to God and I say, God, there are a lot of verses I know that I'm not living out. God, I know what you say on a lot of things, but it has not made its way into my decision making. Maybe some of you would say, be so honest this morning to say, God, I've heard about you. I've heard about Jesus. I've sang songs about Jesus and to Jesus, but I'm not saved. Jesus Christ himself is the very first foundation of our life. And we build from that. And here Jesus, the very word of God, is telling us, take these words that he's given us and not just keep them up here, but allow them to live out through our life, through action. We either tear that house down and get back to the core, get all the way down to the foundation, or it gets blown down. And I know 
some of us in our culture might flippantly say, well, if that's my house, I'll just sell it and move, right? It'll be the next owner's problem, right? That's our culture. Let me tell you something. There was no good shepherd, like, real estate, okay, in that day. You didn't put your house on the market. Do you know who got your house if you sold it? (laughs) Which you wouldn't sell it, but you know who got your house after you? In a culture of generational inheritance would have been your kids. Think about that for a minute. I've told you before, the decisions that are made here don't just affect us in this time. I believe they affect generations to come. And I'm going to ask you to seriously look at your heart. Look at your life. Ask those questions. Where do I turn when I'm making decisions? When I'm leading my family, what do I base my decisions off of? What matrix do I use? God, what do I know that I'm not walking in obedience to right now today? I pray this morning that some will come to faith in Jesus Christ, just like several of our children did at camp this week, made that decision to be in a lifelong relationship through through salvation with Jesus. Maybe some of you, it's a rededication. Maybe you know the church was a season in your life. There was a moment where you were really serious, but now you've kind of gotten away from it. Man, may each one of us this morning be able to lift our eyes to heaven and say from the core of our heart, God, thank you. You've not kept the storms away. But that you've given me the ability to endure through the foundation. And if you're here this morning and you say in your heart, God, I know I'm building on sand And lift up your eyes to heaven. And say, God, thank you. That your mercy and your long suffering has seen fit to keep the EF5 out of my house to this moment. Thank God that he has kept that storm away to the extent that you could come to this moment to change that foundation. What is your decision today? Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.